Yeah. So, um, now what I want is that to be coming in as Testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Playback speed. And there is no reason why.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Colin Bailey and I'm the President and Principal here at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and I would like to welcome you to this fantastic university here in the heart of the East End. Very quickly about the university. The university's got a history dating back to 1785. We are represented on campus from 162 countries. And I always say to our students and our staffs, where else can you appreciate and learn from people from different backgrounds, different traditions, and different cultures? At the university, we are pushing the boundaries of research and innovation, which is having an impact locally, nationally, and internationally on the economy and on society. And I'm very pleased this evening to welcome you to the Peter Hennessy uh, Lecture. Now, the uh, Peter Hennessy um, Lecture is a flagship lecture through our Marland Institute. And our Marland Institute is looking at policy and politics, the research and how they are shaping uh, UK life in an ever-changing environment, both in the UK and globally. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Peter Hennessy, uh, Lord Hennessy, to say a few words before we start and introduce our guest of honour, Lord Neil Kinnock. Um, now, Peter uh, is a Natalie professor uh, here in our School of History at Queen Mary. He is a senior advisor and patron to the Marland Institute, and he is a firm believer of what we're trying to do here at Queen Mary in shaping so many lives of the local population, but also nationally uh, and internationally. Peter is a cross-bench peer in the House of Lords, and he was a journalist for over 20 years, working at the Times, the Financial Times, and The Economist. So without further ado, I will ask now Peter Hennessy to say a few words, and then, of course, introduce our guest of honour, Lord uh, Neil Kinnock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin, very much for that wonderfully warm welcome. Welcome to you all as well. It's a special evening when Neil's around. Oscar Wilde famously said, the trouble with socialism is it takes up too many evenings. <laughs> but not if Neil Kinnock's there, it doesn't. <laughs> I've known Neil for a long time, actually, and uh, every, every conversation's a sparkle. I can remember the first conversation, Neil, you probably can't. It's the spring of 76, when Harold Wilson, to everybody's surprise, says he's standing down. There's a leadership contest, extraordinary leadership field. Tony Crossland, Roy Jenkins, Tony Benn, Michael Foote, your great friend and patron, Jim Callahan. Somebody else I've forgotten, Dennis. He Dennis, is. Yeah. I mean, what a field, eh? Those were the days. But Michael didn't... Uh, <laughs> Well, that was a bit unfortunate, wasn't it? I shouldn't have said that, really. <laughs> you left out Tony Ben. Tony Ben, yes, yeah. Tony Ben, our friend. No show without our Tony. Our friend. And Michael Foote, very honourable man, wonderful man, didn't want to talk to the press, didn't want to be seen to be pushing his own cause. So Neil was looking after that side of it, and we went for lunch in Bertarelli's in Charlotte Street. And we talked about R.H. Tawney, we talked about Nye Bevan, the great poet of post-war British politics. And it was a terrific time. We only talked about Michael for about three minutes. But uh, that's how I remember it, the first occasion, Neil. And it's been a treat ever since when we've met. But the plan for this evening is that Neil and I will converse for about 35 to 40 minutes. Then we'll have 20 minutes or so for Q&A. And then we'll go and have a drink. So I hope that suits everybody. It is hallowed ground here, Neil, as you know, for Labour history, because it's in this very hall that Clem Attlee on the 26th of July, 1945, the count for the Limehouse constituency was in here, as well as the Mile End seat. And it was in here that Clem Attlee realized he was going to be prime minister with a majority. So this is holy ground, which makes you even more welcome. <laughs> now talking about- And envious. <laughs> and envious, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 146 seat majority, wasn't it? Let's go back to the 40s and the early 50s, the making of you as a boy and a young man in the 60s, out of the labor movement of South Wales. T talk about the, tell us about the compost that made you. I can remember those valleys. My auntie Molly had a pub in Newport, which was dry on a Sunday. So we'd drive up the valleys through your area to the Brecon Beacons and the Black Mountains. It was packed with collieries, 
railways, the great Ebervale steelworks, and you came out of that formation. You're the classic product of the labor movement of the early post-war years, aren't you? Absolutely, and uh, indeed uh, uh, an inheritor and a debtor, uh, because everything that I am and um, everything I've tried to contribute and believe uh, derives from that background, packed as it was, as you say, with all the elements and evidence of heavy industry, dangerous work, uh, coal mines, coke works, brick works, steel works, works were in everything. And in fact, um, you may be amused to know, I, in the house that we lived after my parents left the one room that they had when I was born, um, uh, we went to a terraced house in Vale Terrace in Tredegar, uh which was uh, rotten with rodents and uh, black beetles that we used to call black pats, uh, as in all colliery areas. Uh, but I didn't recognize that then. I was a kid of three or four. And um, uh, at the back of our house was the gas works. <laughs> Running outside the gas works was the main uh, railway line from Tredega down to Newport, and we faced on to Tetris Colliery, uh, which uh, closed in 1958, first anti-pit closure demonstration I was ever involved in. And uh, you can imagine what the atmosphere was there. My mother, I remember, used to come to the door when I was playing in the garden and say, Neil, coming in and have your tea. It's on the table and it's getting dirty. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, myth, myth, a little bit of myth, little bit of mythology, but I, that was the background. And of course, it was. It's an awful cliche, but it, like a lot of cliches, absolutely true. It was a truly close knit community, and it had a real dynamic, um, and uh, it expressed itself with amateur theat theatricals, uh, a world-class uh, silver band, which were world champions, still survives, I'm a vice president of it. Um, they won the world championships two years ago, so they're still going strong. A huge male voice choir. And uh, on uh, Sunday, last Sunday, Sunday of the month, right throughout the winter, celebrity concerts. I heard Benjamino Gili, Gili sing in the Workmen's Hall in Tredegar. So the idea that there were these narrow valleys with narrow views is rubbish, because I think that people conscious of their uh, disadvantage and their, the narrowness of their condition really very deliberately and collectively extended their horizons massively in order to nourish creativity. And in that atmosphere, of course, a huge premium was put on education both for its fulfillment, uh, but also as the means of escape. And uh, that was uh, the background without romanticizing at all, uh, against which I grew up with a wonderfully loving uh, and happy, hardworking family. Uh, to call them industrious would be to understate it, but they certainly were creative and imaginative as well. And that extended through the family, not just my mum and dad. There's a great tradition of adult education. The Miners Institute libraries yes. were yes. something, weren't they? They're, preser they're preserved in Swansea University. Howell Francis yes. has preserved them. But that was entirely natural, wasn't it? You, you'd mix with people who were up to their eyes in Hegel. Yeah, uh, I mean, we were just talking beforehand about <laughs> Neil when he was a young Workers' Educational Association lecturer, ending up with men and women who read everything. Uh, and understood it. And understood it as well, yeah. It, mind you, you could take a knock back. I, uh, when I was doing A-levels in a very, very creamed grammar school, uh, loose school Pengam, uh, you had to get 97% in all three papers to be considered. Uh, it was formerly for Munglesha boys, which I was, until three years before, it had been a scholarship system. They ended that happily. Um, but anyway, uh, myself and six other lads from Tredegar uh, managed to satisfy the requirements and were admitted to uh, the school that Lloyd George, in attempted flattery, called the Eton 
of South Wales. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I went to this school and uh, I wasted my time most of the time I was there. It wasn't the school's fault. It was in, entirely my fault. Um, but, you know, a real premium was put on the ability to show merit and succeed and then uh, you could be excused for thinking you were on a kind of conveyor belt and it would just roll along. Anyway, when I was 17, I was doing A-levels and uh, I joined a National Council of Labour Colleges class in the back room of the Tredegar Arms in Tredegar. And there were about 16 or 17 other people there, including uh, most notably uh, the survivors of the Query Club that had been formed by an Aaron Bevan and his contemporaries uh, in the 1920s and had actually run Tradiga during the general strike. They were called the Tradiga Soviet. And these were very smart guys. Uh, I think the latest any of them had been in school was at the age of 13. Uh, distinguished even amongst this distinguished outfit uh, was Councillor Oliver Jones, wonderful man, who comforted me once when I said that I uh, hadn't done well in the exams and I wasn't going to be able allowed to do Latin next year. He said, oh, don't worry about that, young kinnock. Don't worry about that at all. It's not so long ago. There were millions of people walking around speaking fluent Latin <laughs> and they didn't have a university place among them. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of guy he was. Anyway, uh, being smart in this class, which I, I was by far the youngest member of the class, and um, Marcel Hausier, our lecturer from the extramural department in Cardiff University, was a wonderful teacher, great economist, and um, uh, he was a Hungarian who was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, where he'd been wounded horribly, and then uh, captured and tortured, and his whole physical frame was, as a consequence, ruined. But he had a mind like a jewel, wonderful man. And he said, um, it was, I'll never forget, it was the day that de Gaulle took the franc back on the gold standard. <laughs> Even you might not remember that. I don't day. remember. Oh, with the, the extraordinary memory. Anyway, um, we turned up at the class and Marcel said, you've heard the news tonight about uh, President de Gaulle. Um, what do you think that this means? And there was silence. And like a smart ass, I said, um, and I used to use phrases like this in those days. Marcel, I think it might be a harbinger of the downfall of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was such an inelegant phrase, which is why I remember it. And there was a pause, and everybody was very, very kind to me. And Oliver Jones said, Marcel, can I offer a view to our young friend, which is what I used to be called, unpatronizingly, uh, by all means, Oliver. Um, uh, can I tell you about capitalism, which is how people of his generation used to pronounce the word. Uh, capitalism, as you'll find, is like a mountain stream. There it is, bubbling at the top of the hill. You can put a dam on it. You can, as we found to our great cost, build a housing estate on it. You can put clodges on it. You can do what you like to control it. And when you get to the bottom of the hill, there's the bugger coming out again. <laughs> and he, he taught me a lesson about capitalism, which I've never forgotten. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that was all by the way. Sorry. You, you, you're one of the few people around, or the few people I know anyway, who heard Nye Bevan speak mm. as a boy. Mm. And uh, the extraordinary combination of the thought, the, the flights of thought that would combine so many things with perfect timing, never over-prepared, the spontaneity of it, which you very rarely see in politics now. He didn't know where he was starting, where he was going to be in the middle or at the end until you heard him, did he? Capture for us what it was like to hear Nye. Um, well, you, mean, you said earlier in your kind introduction that uh, Nye was a poet of politics, and he was, but a very practical poet of politics. And it was a third P, pragmatism. <coughs> In order to achieve advance, he was always willing to be pragmatic. Uh, he spoke of, very dismissively, of 
what he called so-called socialists, <laughs> uh, who threatened to pr nationalize everything and end up nationalizing nothing. They are purists, and therefore, it's the most important word, and therefore, barren. And he held them in total scorn, the ultra-left. But he, so he is this practical poet. And to listen to him, I think I must have been about 12 when my father took me to hear him. Indeed, I was, no, I was, yes, I was 12. He was in the Suez Crisis. And the title of the meeting, which was also addressed by Michael Foote and Ian Mercado, in the Workmen's Hall in Tredegar, which was a theater, a beautiful theater, uh, that sat 1,800 people. But when I spoke, there would be 2,200 more, because uh, people were standing alongside. And it was broadcast by Tannoy outside in Morgan Street in Tredegar. And uh, <clears throat> my father took me on the Sunday night, and we got there early, so we had a really great seat. And uh, Nye spoke, and I can't pretend that uh, 12 years of age I, that I comprehended the issues. Um, I mean, I read the News Chronicle religiously at home, or what I didn't read was read out to me, because that's, I, I mean, it still goes on. It still happens in our house. I guess it happens everywhere. Uh, but anybody hitting a particular resonant sentence from uh, James Cameron or other great writers of the time. Oh, listen to this. And so you couldn't be but conscious without anything being rammed down your throat uh, of the environment and times in which you were living. So uh, that much I knew, but I didn't know the intricacies in the way that Bevan explained them. And it was hypnotic. It was, it was funny. Uh, and what I came to recognize to be cadences and silences that spoke volumes and sentences that became long and really forceful so that they belted you at the end uh, and other sentences that were finished. Just let the imagination. And I never forget, I don't remember what quotation it was, but uh, there was a quotation from the Bible and there was a damn great chunk of what I thought was Shakespeare. But when I did my A-levels, I discovered it was from Christopher Marlowe from <laughs> Dr. Faustus. And uh, it was so resonant, and he never condescended to the audience. He never avoided using complicated words. And uh, sometimes he would use it with an accent. He would say, and the audience would, there'd be a titter running through it, you know. I can give you an example. I can actually quote a speech. Uh, in the 1959 general election, and I died two years afterwards, um, I went down to Abergavenny, to the Monmouth constituency, to support the Labour candidate, Joe Richardson, of beloved memory. And I never, I was 17, I'd never really encountered any Tories before in my whole life. <laughs> I just, I mean, I, I knew we had a baker living down the road from us who was a Tory or said he was. But that's because he was a baker and he had a car and it was nothing to do with politics. <clears throat> anyway, I, I went down and uh, I canvassed uh, an, uh, an absolutely new concept to me. I canvassed, uh, together with some other youngsters from around South Wales, uh, in support of Joe. And the Everpool rally was to be addressed by a night in, who conventionally, since the 1930s, had gone to somewhere in the Monmouth constituency, Asko, Abergavenny, to speak on behalf of the candidate. He spoke for Michael Foote when he was the candidate uh, in 1936, I think it was. And uh, so he came to speak for Joe. And then he would hair up Black Rock to the heads of the valleys and finish up in the Workmen's Hall in Tredega. So my intention was to go to the Abergavenny meeting and then in a friend's car get up to Tredega and listen to both. But I was drafted in 
as a bouncer, which was more convincing then than it is now because <laughs> I, I was an inveterate rugby player anyway, and um, they put me on the doors, and I was given the task of ushering Nye Bevan into the hall because I was from Chadiga. I don't know if they thought I'd speak his language or something, but this was Abergavenny. Anyway, the market, <laughs> the market hall in Abergavenny, and of course Nye is late. Uh, it's very late. And the poor old sod, the only Labour councillor in Abergavenny, a county councillor, was given the task of just keeping the meeting going. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever been there, Peter, but it is a dreadful, dreadful role. It, it, uh, I think it must be worse than giving out the Academy Awards in Los Angeles, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, this old fellow was aspirantly uh, embarrassed. In fact, he didn't have an H in the proper place in his whole vocabulary. So I was hover in the all. Well, it meant I was over in the hall. Anyway, he trundled on, and in the front, there were two rows of young Tories drafted in by bus from Cardiff, who gave him a hell of a time. And they were vile to him, it was dreadful. And he had no means of controlling it, and the chairman didn't want to put off the audience, packed, absolutely packed out. And eventually, Nye turned up, and came in through the door behind me, and I turned around and I said, I'll take you down now, Mr. Bevan. He said, no, no, let me get the smell. Let me get the smell. So uh, after a minute or so, he heard all this heckling and booing and catcalling of this poor old county councillor, an old railway man he was. And he said, we well, go down now, boy. So I took him down, and he was observed coming down the aisle. The chair, with some relief, got up and said, comrades and friends, and then in the land. <laughs> Tumultuous greeting, <coughs> except, of course, from the young Tories. And I got on the stage and uh, immediately took out one piece of paper from his uh, pocket, which he always had. I never actually saw him looking at one, but nevertheless. And he leaned into the microphone and almost in a whisper, he said, uh, comrades and friends, it's a great delight to be here uh, with you on the eve of the victory. And the Tories tittered and other people mildly applauded. And he said, uh, I want to impart to you some news. The news is I don't hate all Tories. And they did exactly what you just did. In fact, it's fair to say there are one or two of them I can even admire for their kindness to their children and their care for their wives and their resources. Another titter. So it can fairly be said, and his voice was slightly rising in volume, it can fairly be said that the Narin Devon is not a man who detests people just because they are conservatives. What I hate is snobs! <laughs> and point of End of story. <laughs> and then he carried on with his speech. And, and that was just in three sentences, four sentences, he'd gone through, oh, I don't know, Henry IV part one. I mean, it was, it was extraordinary. It was a great, great performance, but with real import, real yeah. force. And then he went on to make a wonderful speech. We'll come on to Michael Foot in a minute, his great disciple and your great mentor. But the other influences on you in terms of your democratic socialism were reading R.H. Tawney, weren't they? Yeah. What was it that hit you between the eyes from Tawney? Uh, and what's relevant now? Tawney's plain language. Uh, he was an extraordinarily uh, gifted intellect. Um, with the mark of all great intellects, he had the ability to be simple and to be deductive in a way that took you through his arguments. A anybody, literally anybody, 
could read, understand, and then I think sympathize with Tawny. Uh, it's entirely relevant now. Um, he wrote a great essay, uh, We Mean Freedom. He wrote it in 1942 uh, for the New Yorker. And it was in order to convince the United States that they'd done the right thing in December 1941 in joining the uh, British and, and uh, Commonwealth forces in resistance to the Nazis and, they should, and, the, and the Japanese Empire, and they should have no doubt about it. And I, it was resonant, uh, or resonant's not the right word. It was, it reminded me when I read it later of Orwell's Lion and the Unicorn. Mm. Uh, because here was really forceful, progressive patriotism, uh, which Orwell uh, used the term, patriots love their country, nationalists hate other countries. <laughs> I think it's not a bad definition, especially when you come against the so-called alt-right and the uh, far-right and the Nazis of today. Uh, they uh, beat their chest for patriotism, but you know, it's detestation of others that is their main motive rather than love of country. And what Tony did in that essay was to convey the absolute quintessential argument for combating uh, the Axis forces and everything that Nazism and fascism meant. It was wonderful stuff. Uh, it didn't prevent him from making the democratic socialist argument. In it, for instance, I mean, this is really up to date as to the last couple of days when we are getting a rehearsal or repeat yet again of uh, the presentation of the market economy and capitalism as the savior of the world, uh, the last refuge of an embarrassed conservative in my view, but there you are. Um, and uh, it being done in a didactic way that can't be expected to win the argument. And there, I mean, there are serious arguments in, fa in favor of the mixed market economy. There's no question about it at all. And many of the attributes claimed for it are absolutely true. But what um, Tony said was um, uh, about arguments about the state. The state is an instrument, no more, no less. It is not an animate being. In stupid, greedy hands, it will be stupid and greedy. In enlightened and generous hands, it would be enlightened and generous. And when you think about it, and all the guff that surrounds philosophies and ideologies of the state, to cut through it like that. And then he goes on to say, of course, it's a very important instrument which is why there's such a struggle to control it. And then he develops the argument into democracy. But uh, the simplicity of that idea to sort of sit back and say, well, damn, I knew that, but I never recognized it in those terms. And that's the heartwarming thing about Bevan, about Orwell, about Tawny, about some other people. Galbraith is another one. Um, who you could read or hear and agree with because you'd always thought that, but you'd never had the words or the confidence or whatever else it took, the poetry, to produce that sentence in that way. I'd be so damn proud if I could produce a sentence that reduced the state to an instrument, no more, no less. And to, uh, I didn't need convincing, I was already there for years before I read it, but to hear it with that simplicity and the power of that simplicity was wonderful, and that's why he's applicable now. That, I mean, that's a tiny, tiny, minuscule fragment of the genius of R.H. Tony, but um, if it induces anybody to go off and read Richard Tony, uh, if you can get one of the books, um, then my mission will be served. Absolutely. <laughs> You linked him with George Orwell and the yeah. classic essay, Line in the Unicorn. Yeah. 
written in the Blitz, published in 1941. When you were leader of the Labour Party, and we'll come to that in a minute as well, you said everybody, you said to a friend of mine, Richard Waite, after one of our seminars, historical seminars, that you thought every aspirant member of the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party should read it. Now, why should they? Oh, why should today's Shadow Cabinet read it? Um, apart from anything else, both in The Lion and the Unicorn and earlier than that, in The Road to Wigan Pier, the second part of Road to Wigan Pier, which is a polemic, uh, the first part is a, a telling report into poverty and in, uh, inequality and injustice. The second part uh, is uh, Orwell's philosophy. And uh, he might even have used the same phrase twice, but it's uh, definitely in the road to Wigan Pier, and I'm certain is in The Lion and the Unicorn. Um, the cause of socialism, above all else, is liberty. That reality should ring like a clarion trumpet across the nations. Instead, it is too often buried by ideologues, like a jewel in the dung hill. <laughs> when I read that first, I was a kid when I read that first. And I thought, nobody will ever exceed that passion, that clarity. And the fact that the man lived by that code exposed <coughs> humbug and oppression, uh, bigotry, um, and despotism, uh, little tiny despotisms, as well as great big global despotisms, and did it with uh, mellifluously in ways that invited you to turn the page, you know, um, a, a real inspiration. Talking of inspirations, another great words with Michael Foote, yeah. uh, who you revere, uh, wonderful man. How important was Michael in motivating you to want to become an MP yourself? Um, I, I should say, incidentally, I never revered him because he would have scorned me <laughs> if I did. Um, uh, I, I don't know if he had any part in motivating me. Um, I was very, very fortunate because I was a constituent of his and active uh, in labor politics, student politics. He took so Nye's seat in 1960 yeah. after he died. He, yeah. he, was, uh, he was elected in the by-election. Yeah. Having been excluded from the shortlist by the National Executive Committee. <laughs> and um, I was the youth delegate to the Tredegar uh, constituency party. And of course, all hell let loose when he was excluded. And, but on the list uh, was Ron Evans, who was very highly regarded local councillor and had been Nye's agent since 1950. Uh, Ex-Chindit, steel worker, really great man. I mean, great man, Ron. Um, and a, a huge Bevanite and admirer of Michael. And with great generosity, he got his a group in the constituency to withhold their votes to endorse the National Executive Committee. No, let's have a real contest, said Nye. And I'd be privileged to go up against Michael Foote. Now, there are very few people in any walk of life, including politics, who would do that, but they did. And uh, they wrote a furious letter to, uh, to the National Executive Committee and said, they were going to send a, a strong deputation up to the NEC in order to protest about the way in which the NEC had uh, set aside the candidature of Michael Foote, duly nominated by Miners Lodges and God knows what. Uh, anyway, the NEC relented, or at least Gateskill resent, relented. Michael was on the shortlist and got selected as the candidate, fought the by-election, uh, I got a very good majority and everything was fine. And I, obviously I was very active in the by-election. I met him only once during the by-election. Um, and then subsequently, uh, as a university student, um, we had a mutual friend, Bill Harry, the guy who recruited me at 14 years of age to the Labour Party, our local county councillor. And I, Glenys and I used to go walking 
uh, with Michael on Sunday mornings um, on the hills around Tredegar and over to Ever Whale, um, which he loved to do. And of course, uh, I got to know him very well and got to be his friend as well as his adoring admirer. I make a frank confession of that. Uh, not simply because of his greatness as a journalist or as a speaker or as a parliamentarian or an internationalist, all those things, fine. But he was one of the most sensitive and kindly, courteous men. He probably the most courteous man I've ever encountered. And I've known a few ladies and gents who deserve the title. But uh, he was a wonderful character. And um, uh, the idea, I think he would have sort of uh, brushed it aside, make up your own mind if I'd raised the possibility of seeking a parliamentary seat. But in any case, it was such a distant prospect that um, until I graduated and got a job and Glennis and I got married, and we'd settled down, it never really started to formulate as a possibility in my mind. Um, and I, I don't think I ever talked to Michael about it, though Jill, his wife, Jill Craigie, beautiful woman, um, she would go on about it, and she might have talked to Michael about it, because she certainly talked to Glennis about it repeatedly, and also to me, you're the next, you're the next. and. Uh, I would used to embarrass the hell out of me, as you can well imagine. And then the way in which, very accidentally, uh, things fell my way mm. uh, meant that I became a candidate at, uh, well, I was 27 years of age. And you were elected in 1970. Yeah. Why did you never accept office in the Wilson or Callaghan governments, Neil? Because Michael, I'm sure, wanted you to. He was Deputy Prime Minister. Um, oh, yes. Yes, he did. Uh, in the Wilson government, um, I had the kind of number 12 shirt. I was invited to second the Queen's speech, the loyal address, um, in, when we uh, managed not to lose the election in, uh, um, in February 1974. 74. And uh, this was generally in being allocated to a young backbencher uh, a way of sending a message, the next vacancy in the government is yours. Um, but I knew it wasn't going to be me because Wilson, while in opposition, had sent me in his place, together with uh, three other uh, backbenchers, including his PPS, Charlie, um, and uh, had sent us to Russia. He did an official invitation uh, from Brezhnev uh, to visit the Soviet Union and uh, hadn't been able to do it, but asked if he could send four youngsters instead because uh, Wilson had a mixture of fear and respect for the Soviet Union. The white heat of technology speech was actually all about this, that Russia would develop as such an economic and scientific power such an industrial giant that this was the contest we were going to have. Anyway, he retained that view, uh, which I didn't think about telling you to, and I'd always been very suspicious of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, I think it was Bevan who said, it's the future waiting to be born. <laughs> and um, when I got there for this fortnight visit, we decided beforehand that we would go, apart from Moscow, to new and rebuilt places. So we went to Novosibirsk and Akadem Gorodok in central Siberia, which was newly built. And, uh, but we also went to what was then just becoming called Volgograd, um, Stalingrad, which had been 84% rebuilt. And to Leningrad, uh, formerly and latterly St. Petersburg, which had been substantially rebuilt. And it was remarkable, but I came back and I wrote a memo, which I thought was my duty to Wilson, saying, uh, among other things, we really didn't have to worry too much about the 
rise of Russia as an industrial power, they literally couldn't make the lifts work. So how the hell they were ever going to aim an intercontinental ballistic missile accurately at this, I didn't know. And it was, I was, you know, 25% joking, but 75% was what I thought was a serious critique of a system of oppression and incompetence where the stupidity was built in. And when we had a couple of KGB people with us who were patently very smart people, indeed brilliant people, uh, but they would suppress their own thoughts manifestly in the course of a conversation. And I thought, bloody hell, um, again, as Bevan said, that um, no industrial power has ever succeeded. Some have been achieved, but none have succeeded in the absence of popular democracy, which is still true even when we observe China, is still true. Um, and, you know, that view I'd taken throughout, even before I'd read Bevan saying it, I knew in my gut that there was something wrong with that system. Anyway, this visit proved it, and I made the error, well, if it was an error, of writing to uh, Wilson saying it, uh, whereas upon his enthusiasm for me as a coming young star diminished greatly. So I knew that regardless of seconding the Queen's speech and all the rest of it, uh, or proposing the Queen's speech, that it wasn't going to happen. In any case, I swapped my position with a guy called Ray Carter, who was a very decent bloke, but was desperately disappointed by not being a junior minister. So I felt so sorry for him. Uh, we were in the Chief Whip's office in number 12, and I said, hey, Ray, would you like to move the speech? Oh, could I? He said, and I said, ah, oh, yeah, you, you do it instead of me, and, and I'll take you a place, and I'll second it. So that's what we did. And the speaker, actually, um, uh, it was Selwyn. Lloyd. Selwyn. I uh, actually started to call Mr. Ne uh, Mr. Ray Carter. <laughs> anyway, Ray was very happy and was made a junior minister a few months later, and that's very good. But um, I, I knew I'd fallen out of favor. Jim was different. Jim had been a friend since I campaigned for him in the early 60s. Um, very, very hard. And uh, Glenis being the secretary of the Social Society in University College in Cardiff, uh, there were 3,200 undergraduates there. 800 of them were members of the Socialist Society. So you can imagine the forces we could deploy on the street for Jim. Yeah. And we put up his majority from 700 to 7,000 and then to 12,000 and it was all. And uh, Jim and I always had political differences, but we always got on. He's a really decent man and very generous man. Anyway, he asked me if I would uh, join the government when he became prime minister. And I had fundamental differences over the government's public expenditure policy, which I thought was utterly mistaken. And as the weeks were passing with the policy for the kind of devolution that they were proposing. And I just said to Jim, I'm really sorry. I would like to serve you and the movement and all the rest of it, but it would be profoundly dishonest and inconsistent. And so thanks, but no thanks. And the same thing happened about uh, 10 months later, I think it was, uh, when there was a reshuffle and he asked me again. And I said, I listen, we're even deeper in now, especially with the devolution arguments. And I said, I, you know, my first obligation is to try and uphold the interests of my constituency. And it would directly contradict the loyalty I would have to give as a matter of honor to the government. Mm. So I didn't, and he was very understanding, he was very kind. He was brassed off but he was very kind about it. And then a few years later, we'll leap forward, you become leader of the Labour Party yourself. You're the only man I know who can date his midlife crisis to the hour. <laughs> Do you want to explain? Well, I, no, here's a coincidence. Today's October the 3rd, yesterday was October the 2nd, and I became leader of the Labour Party about five o'clock on the afternoon of October the 2nd, uh, 1983. 
So that was what, 34 years ago, yesterday. And I can, as you say, I can date my midlife crisis precisely from then till 2 p.m. on the afternoon of Saturday, the 18th of July, 1992. <laughs> and you cease to be leader. When I cease to be leader, yes. <laughs> <coughs> you had a terribly tough first two years because it coincided with the miners' strike, yeah. flesh of your flesh, and yet the leadership of the miners' union was not your style of leadership, and then militant, the expulsion of militant. Mm. Now, I'm not sure we've got much time to go into all the detail of that. Sorry, I've been talking too long. No, 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 you, not at all. But linking with where we are now, I have to be careful here as I'm a neutral sort of person, do you think there's a destructive gene Listen, in the Labour Party? with more neutrals like you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's, very, that's ruined your career. That's no, very I'm kind. <laughs> Do you think there's a destructive gene in the makeup of the Labour Party? I mean, Dennis Healy said to me once, years ago, there's a nice name drop, isn't it? Yeah. Um, when we were talking about the Attlee government, which I'd ri just written a book on, that he reckoned that Labour had run out of things to do that everybody agreed upon once they'd implemented the beverage report, which was pretty well coterminous with the 45-51 Labour governments. And thereafter, the propensity to fall out was going to be much higher. And when you think of your lifetime, there's been th at least three great monumental fallings out, maybe mm. four. Mm. Do you think there's something in the Labour Party and the Labour movement that does lead to this? Uh, I know what Dennis meant. Uh, especially as he observed the late 40s and through the 50s. And he was uh, a young member of parliament from 51, right in the middle of the crossfire. And of course, was international secretary of the party after leaving the forces. And I think he fought a seat and uh, 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 he got it to be a Tory marginal, but he didn't win. And then he, he won the seat in Leeds. Um, so I understand why he would have been scarred in that way by the sheer fruitlessness, as he certainly would have seen it, of the incessant battles going on between Bevanites and Gateskillites and left and right and so on in the Labour Party. But I think uh, he would be wrong if he thought that it was because they'd accomplished so much and uh, therefore lost their pardon the phrase, momentum, uh, <laughs> because the, the great accomplishments, and in any case, they were absolutely whacked, tired, after the years of uh, the Depression, the war, the immense burdens on them as a new government, and all the rest of it. But I actually think that if uh, Clem and you are biographer, so uh, you may profoundly disagree with this, if Clem hadn't been so whacked and fed up by 1950 with the way in which affairs were being conducted, not just by the Bevanites, but those who were trying to take action against them, and the way in which everybody treated things as a contest for every inch of ground and all the rest of it, uh, if he hadn't been as wearied by that, he would have followed his instincts. and. Uh, possibly even have made nine uh, foreign secretary, uh, or even maybe, I don't know, uh, because Gates can have the job, uh, Chancellor, but certainly would have demonstrated respect for nice achievements in establishing the NHS and in being a great housing minister and accomplishing a great deal, as well as the adoration by a big chunk, not all by any means, of the party and some of the trade union movement. And if that had occurred, I think there would have been a quarrel between Bevan and some of the more zealous comrades uh, further to the left, or thinking they were further to the left. But it would have changed the center of gravity. It would have moved the uh, center lines of the battlefield and uh, could have been destructive.